Osiris. What's going on, everybody? It's Karina Reichman coming at you live with another episode of Inappropriate Happiness. I'm joined here today by my mainest man, Isaac Sloan. I boogie what it is. How are you? Karina, I am so good. The sun is shining. It's a beautiful day. And we are between pretty epic trips. And there's a lot to lay down for the listeners. It's really true. And it's and before we even get started, I'd like to just say I am so sorry. I fell ill after what was is a seminal, incredible trip to New Orleans. You know, it, it just caught up to me. What can you say? I took the Cajun, uh, you know, flu home with me. I don't know what to say. And I just... Uh, I was burning the candle at both ends for too long, and that's why we did not have an episode last week, and it was all just absolutely insane. You know, Isaac, you know, uh, Levon said, I ain't in it for my health, right? That was the sort of classic <laughs> Levon line, and it's just like, you know, I consider myself to be a rather healthy individual. Generally speaking, I have not been, like, I've had not even a common cold or anything to speak of since I had COVID last June. But then I feel like these last like three weeks, it all just caught up to me. You know what I mean? And I've just been like, oh my God, now I'm currently on antibiotics, figuring it all out. But, you know, there was uh, a weekend with Marco Benevento where we played four shows in three days. And then the immediate next day I was on Seth Meyers holding it together, playing and whatnot. And then I was supposed to be on for four days. This is May 1, 2, 3, and 4. But... After my first day is right when they announced the writer's strike. And for those of you who don't know, the Writers Guild of America um, is on strike trying to get equal pay or rather, you know, just fair pay for what it is they do, which they absolutely, absolutely deserve. And I stand very much with the writers and hope that this standoff between them and the studios gets resolved quickly because it's been a few weeks already, which is a long time for people to be out of work and not knowing what uh, is happening or where their next dime is coming from. It's a really tough moment in that regard, but obviously something has to change and I admire their ability to come together to figure that out or try to, you know? So uh, that basically right after my first day at Seth Meyers, you know, I wake up the second day to a message being like, you know, you're done. You don't have to come in today. And I think my body just shut down at that point, you know, super, you know, I slept for like 18 hours and then like, you know, four hours in the middle of the day. Just like it was, you know, and I was, I was sick for sure. Then got better for New Orleans. But then in New Orleans, I played until 4.30 in the morning. Like, you know, I was there for three nights, <laughs> played four times. And then had, of the three nights that I was there, two of which, you know, my band played till 3.45 a.m. And Marco Benevento played until 4.30 a.m. It's, it's, a, it's a taxing thing on the body, you could say, you know? Um, probably one of the most taxing things <laughs> that I do, uh, you know, to myself every year. But wouldn't trade it for the world. So it is all good. Um, and then, yeah, got back from New Orleans in the last week. You know, just been absolutely, you know, producing more mucus than a, a human should, I would say. I was like, pretty disgusting. Really not a pleasure to be around. Not charming. And, uh, you know, here we are just trying to figure it all out because we're going to Iceland tomorrow, which is just shocking. So, you know, oh, and in the middle of all this, I played a festival in Albany to like 10,000 people, which was absolutely insane. The WEQX Presents Tulip Festival you know, which, you know, you could ask my band, was I charming to be with on the ride up? Absolutely not. Just hawking loogies out of the car. <laughs> Disgusting. Terrible. So I'm trying to figure it all out, trying to get well, trying to make it all happen and not absolutely burn myself out and wreck my body while also playing the rock shows of the century. I just don't know. It's hard to balance, Isaac. It's hard to balance. <laughs> it is, I mean, rock shows of the century, I was at your late night Blue Nile gig and it really was a spectacular uh, occurrence. Thank you, pal. Thank you. It felt that way. It felt that way. And I was so touched to, you know, and yeah, let's talk about that for a hot second. This was my band's first ever time in New Orleans. 
The show was sold out to the gills, lying around the block at 2 a.m., people trying to get in. Them not, you know, like absolutely unprecedented shit for something like that, you know. And I'm so overwhelmed and grateful for the support that everybody showed me for that night. It was absolutely incredible to play a packed Blue Nile with my own band for the first time. It was absolutely amazing. And uh, we sent it pretty hard, I would say. We sent it pretty hard. Well, I feel like Jazz Fest is one of those interesting things to talk about because people who don't know about the specific rooms and and places are always kind of curious. And people who do know are always excited to hear more and talk about these things. It's like you can't beat the dead horse, right? It's great. It really does feel true. Um, But the Blue Nile is a very special room. And being on Frenchman Street, one of the main strips of different clubs to see late night music during Jazz Fest in New Orleans uh, at any time of year, brings an interesting mix of people because there were friends and family of ours. Correct. There were fans of yours. There were people who are adjacent music fans to your project sure from listening to various other things there are people who just like music and there are people who stumble in because they are in town to party and want to check something out it's there's many many ways that you could find yourself at this concert which is really true but at the same time the amount of, uh, you know, call it competition, you know, out there and the amount of conflicting shows, the amount of music that goes on in a 24-hour period in New Orleans during those two weeks, <laughs> or rather weekends, you know, one of Jazz Fest, you know, is, is staggering. So, like, you know, the fact that people found themselves, you know, at the Blue Nile at that specific time, like, they could have been at about 100 other clubs, <laughs> if not more, seeing you know, absolutely incredible musicians and music going on. So it's it's a crazy thing. It's an amazing phenomenon. I hope to do it till I drop dead. I was reminded about how much I love it, you know, and it was like, it, it really is unlike anything else ever. Like, Jazz Fest is special. If you haven't been, you should think about going. I, uh, I of course, though, when I play these late night gigs, and I've made this mistake in the past, right, with Marco Benevento, I've gone to the fairgrounds during the day, and then had to start a gig at three in the morning. And, you know, for me personally, I don't feel like I can do both. And, which is totally fine, because I'm there to work, and my job happens at three in the morning there, you know what I mean? So I uh, bypass the fairgrounds, which everybody thinks I'm crazy for, but that's totally cool. Um, Isaac happened to go to the fairgrounds. Did you see incredible music and eat incredible food at the fairgrounds? I saw incredible music. I didn't really eat anything at the fairgrounds. Understood. But I was there on Thursday and Friday, and I did see Irma Thomas and Buddy Guy, respectively, set separate sets, both of whom are 86 years old, playing to huge crowds on the main stage of this festival, which was really quite special to see both of them. Um, I saw Santana, who I've seen at the fairgrounds before, and... You know, he said uh, that, you know, there's a a lot of people say there's no place they'd rather be. But when you hear someone like Santana say that, who's had such a storied career, you know, he he was like, you know, I'd I'd rather be here than the Vatican is how he put it on stage. And I was just like, wow. Holy shit. (laughs) It's like, yes, Carlos. Yes, Carlos. Wow. Um, But that, uh, yes, the fairgrounds is a... uh, one of my favorite parts of the Jazz Fest experience. And on our way out, we stopped by the Gospel Tent, which a lot of people have a lot of feelings about. It is a tent where there's gospel music happening all day. And we happened to be there when Pastor Tyrone Jefferson was finishing out his set. And just the spirit in that tent was at you know, a total high and the security guards are clapping along and dancing and reaching out their hands to touch the musicians. Yes. And you kind of know you're in a really good place when I don't know. I feel like when I see that, I know that there's some way in which there's a connection happening through music that feels like it, it, it's hard to always kind of find and not something, you know, I go in expecting to see. Oh, big time. No, that's a rarity and should be, uh, absorbed and appreciated when you see it for sure that's incredible totally. so that was that was my experience of the fairgrounds uh, in short 
Um, and in terms of the late night music, I was so glad to see your project. I went to see Ghost Note at Music Box Village, which was a very cool time. Music Box Village so is a venue art space where there are kinds of tree houses. It's in a sort of more foresty environment. And the tree houses and the different spaces are musical instruments. So you can hit them with mallets. You, they produce certain kinds of sounds. There are percuss- percussive things. There's also a stage where the band was in part set up. But you're kind of surrounded by music coming at you from all of these different angles. And you can walk around it and kind of pick up on different ways that music is being made, different things that people are playing, and different approaches to playing instruments that you kind of uh, sort of take for granted when you're they're in their usual construction on a typical stage. Sure. Big time. Big time. That place is incredible. And I can't actually think of a better band with so many people in it and the finest musicians to walk the earth, like to really put on an incredible show there. It must have been amazing. That's very cool that you saw that. I love it. I love it. I mean, wow. There was so much happening. It was such a blur, you know? When I say that I was there for three nights, it felt like I was there for an eternity. Like, I did, like it was around the clock, which was pretty insane. Well, and also worth mentioning that this was part of the second weekend of this festival that spans two weekends. Right. And has programming, you know, outside of the fairgrounds throughout the week that is pretty heavy you know that isn't i mean you're you're spoiled for choice for over a week straight big time big time and it was funny i i landed at around 10 30 p.m on thursday and i was uh i was going to go see neil francis at the toulouse theater but you know his tour manager texted me at about 11 30 p.m being like hey somebody asked you about sitting in right and i was like no nobody what no, nobody mentioned any of that to me. He's like, ah, classic. Well, do you want to sit in? <laughs> and I was like, oh, yeah, totally. And I was at that moment at uh, JRAD where I had just met up with my boyfriend, my manager, my drummer. That's like just where we met, you know, at the JRAD show. And then we were all hanging out. And I was like, oh, guys, uh, I got to go grab my bass for the next uh, installment of you know i literally just got off the plane i'm at hearing grateful dead music and i'm gonna go down to the toulouse theater and now i'm not just going to enjoy music i'm going to play it so you know it was very funny and then everybody was like oh shit okay here we go and everybody came with me across the street to the hotel grabbed the bass got in a car went to sound check you know and then it was uh that was a real pleasure of like you know the first night i wanted to like push my sleep schedule back so uh, the next night when i had my headlining show i'd be like good to go you know and i did just that because my sit in with neil happened at 308 a.m. which is a wholesome time when it comes to jazz fest and <laughs> that was uh that was great i was like all right well we really pushed it back today that was good and uh and then the next day was my band's show and then the following day, I sat in with the Disco Biscuits at the Mahalia Jackson Theater for the Performing Arts and played late night with Marco Benevento. And then I went home the next day. And it was just like a crazy whirlwind. And I'm so thank you, Neil Francis. Thank you, the Disco Biscuits, for having me. Completely um, um, like impromptu, you know. And every, you know, Mark Brownstein was just like, hey, you know let's dance by david bowie i was like yes i do he's like cool we should try that and i was like oh yeah awesome that would be amazing you know and there i am in the hotel room like you know shedding it going over the tune being like oh yeah i totally know this song it's great we're good we're good and then next thing you know he like gives me the bass on stage jumps around which he says he hasn't done that i mean we you know since 1999 with O'Teal at the wetlands well, and he also said that you are the only person he would take his base off for. I'm honored, Mark. I'm honored. I mean, come on. It's been a beautiful year with the Disco Biscuits, I will say. I've had very I've I've had the pleasure of opening for a lot of bands this year, each of which are, you know, incredible mentors to me in their own ways and in, you know, just offering me to you know warm up the stage for them is incredible and whatnot but with the biscuits you know i feel like i've opened what five 
or f- yeah, maybe five Disco Biscuit shows this year. And of course, tomorrow, here we go. We're going to Iceland to open for them at, you know, one of the most prestigious concert halls <laughs> ever called Harpa and, you know, all that stuff. So it's just been a wonderful adventure with those guys. And I'm really just beyond touched because it's a band that you and I have been listening to for a very long time. Mainly you. I defer to you when I need to know what's happening. I'm like, Isaac, what's happening in, in this <laughs> Disco Biscuit set? He's like, oh, that's... It's this song. I'm like, oh, right, right, right. I know this song. Yeah. Isaac's the real scholar of the band. But I love them, and I love them as people, and I love their music. And it was an insane, you know, to play Let's Dance by Bowie, and then it goes into a 20-minute long techno jam. I didn't see it coming. You know, I was just like, oh, shit, here we go. No, that was a really substantial jam. You know, I was on the way home at this point, but I was getting videos. Like, I didn't (laughs) even realize I was, my phone was connected to the internet, and I was just getting videos from people recording the stream, people who were in the room, people were texting me, asking me where I was, (laughs) and I was like, wait, wait, what's happening? And expected, I I knew you were going to play Let's Dance, but then I opened up the videos, and it was like this deep jam that had clearly deviated from the progression oh yeah and you were just making music that you you were playing that sounded like you and it also sounded like the disco biscuits so that to me i was just beaming with excitement and then the soundboard came out the next day and i've listened to the jam a couple of times it's just it's so great and what a way to uh you know be in New Orleans for Jazz Fest <laughs> at the same time. I mean, uh, we went to that theater the first night and it was like, oh, great, a Disco Biscuit show. And then you get out and you can go to Verdi Mart and you can, right. you know, go to Blue Nile and you're just in the middle of New Orleans. It's so Jazz Fest. I really love the different environment aspect of being in New Orleans, just the different ways to soak it in. And places that you find yourself and you're looking around you're like okay this now we're here yeah, and it like, looks what? like this and this music's <laughs> happening it's a very to me that's a, a, one of the coolest things about it couldn't agree more couldn't agree more and you know yet again ladies and gentlemen we hope you find yourself there one day if you are not already a deep new orleans jazz fest cat because holy shit couldn't recommend it more I uh, I have a good feeling I'll be back next year, Isaac. I would like to never miss a year again. I feel like that, uh, it cemented it for me. Like, I'm good to go. And it's cool that it's so welcoming of newcomers. I was thinking about Neil Francis, yeah. who I don't know if he has played Jazz Fest before, but he's certainly on the scene now. I saw him at the Days Between Festival. Uh, he had a number of different sets throughout the whole festival, and I imagine he will be back. Oh, yeah. Our friends in Melt played Chicky Wawa late night, also played the Days Between Festival, and you know clearly really loved it i mean for me hearing them play there was very very special and uh it, i i we, i know we've again beating the dead horse <laughs> but it really does it, i find influence the way musicians play to spend time there oh my god yeah as it should you know it's really it's a special special place <laughs> It's the only city, it's the only American city that's defined by its culture. I say it all the time, I'll say it again. It's really just true. Like, defined. Like, that's it. You know what I mean? That's what it is. It just feels so different down there. And man, may everybody go and experience it. You know, I was very uh, blessed to have lunch with John Modeski on Sunday, right before my flight. He's a dear pal. Love this guy. And he was telling me about playing Jazz Fest for the first time at like a Margaritaville in 1993, the year I was born, to like seven people. And him and Chris Wood and Billy Martin just trucked it down there, wide-eyed, ready to fucking go. And like, you know, I don't know. It's just amazing to see him 30 years later doing 100 gigs a day. Or, well, not really. That's not true. Because he actually, he said he whittled it down this year for sure. But, you know. He was on, still on the, I looked at some of these schedules. Oh, yeah. He was pretty present. He was wildly pl- present that second weekend for sure. But it's just cool. You know, you get soaked in, you know, like the idea that he's been doing this, you know, since the year I was born and in such a powerful and permanent and present way, you know, and it just keeps going. I'm like, Wow. That's fucking amazing, you know? And with Marco Benevento, for those who don't know, you know, uh, that was his 20th Jazz Fest, which is crazy. Like, it's just an amazing thing. And for me, you know, to like, 
learn from the greats you know what i mean and just like you know soak in all of the wisdom and all the vibe and just be like man like it's so cool let's fucking go you've been doing this forever i want to do this forever this is like what could be better you know so in summation you can't beat the dead horse enough place is great we hope to see you there next year (laughs) it's good enough to spend a whole uh, episode talking about it isn't it (laughs) isaac You may hear from us next episode after we have ridden a horse into a lagoon. In Iceland. We might be speaking about Iceland the way we're talking about New Orleans, but neither of us have ever been there. So there we have this sort of unknown element, which we love, by the way. I love that. It's great. None of my band, you know, our friends, our significant others, nobody's ever been there of our crew, you know, that we're traveling to Iceland with tomorrow. So it's just like so surreal. I bet you we're going to come back and be like, ladies, gentlemen, fuck New Orleans. You got to get to Iceland. This is where the real magic happens, you know? So I can't wait to see what it's all about, dude. We are going to be in multiple lagoons, eating lots of spectacular food, I believe, including the fermented whale shark. (laughs) Which everybody says is, you know, pretty nauseating, but I want to consume it. I have to consume it. I can't wait. Maybe it'll be the cure to <laughs> What your, ails me? Whatever ails you. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. I finished the round of antibiotics on Friday, so, if, you know, if I'm not better by then, I'm going to have to turn to something else. It's probably the whale shark. Um, so that'll be great. And you know who we really wish we could take with us? Is RJB. RJ. Sorry about missing a couple, two, three episodes there, pal. I've been on the brink of uh, death, you know, but I'm back now. Sorry if I sound horribly congested for this uh, fantastic episode. (laughs) And it's just such a pleasure to be under the Osiris umbrella making it rain. Thank you so much for putting us on. I hope to eat the fermented whale shark of life with you either in Iceland one day or in Philly if we can export it. Or in New Orleans. Or in New Orleans, all of our favorite places. He was kind of missing in action, Jazz Fest. Yeah, RJ, where were you, dude? That shit is made for you, right? It really is. No, it really is. I mean, I feel like that's got his number in a big way. And on a reporting level, I wonder if there are other Osiris podcasts talking about Jazz Fest. Yeah, well, you know, if not, you're welcome. And even if so, you can't beat the dead horse, dude. You just can't beat it. (laughs) Is this episode called You Can't Beat a Dead Horse in Iceland? I was going to go with something a little bit more benign. <laughs> Just like a boy. little bit more like, you know, like, what could be better? I love that. <laughs> oh, it's so covert and risque. It's not risque. It is covert. I like it. I like it. Well, time will tell what this episode becomes called. That is, yeah, the words are escaping me. It's great. It's going great. Isaac, should we put a bow on this thing? What do you think? Do we I have other so. things to say? No. Just congratulations to all the grads walking oh, around New yeah. York City. Everyone is in their robes. Put your robe on. You did it. You did it, baby. Well played. And I if think. you didn't graduate, that's okay too. Oh my God, yeah. It's honestly probably better in a lot of ways. You know what I mean? Whatever needs to happen for you, it is all good. Nobody knows better than you. You keep on trucking and we will see you Either next week or the following. Yeah. Bye bye. I learned at camp. Can't even pitch a tent. I've been jumping turnstiles, sailing taxis with intent. Do you need directions? I bet it's not where you from. Osiris.